and I started when I was about three, three years old, three or four. Um, so I've essentially drawn since then. There's one book in particular, actually, by Fuchs, F-U-C-H-S, um, about the nature of matter, and um, I got absolutely fascinated by the subject. And so I just got hooked at that point into physics, into science. That's really what led me in the end to going to Oxford and doing a degree in physics. Always loved art, and it never stopped. I always loved drawing. So when I was at college and I went to university to study physics, um, it, was, it was an interesting time uh, for me because I'd sort of left art behind for a few years. And one of them, a friend called Sarah, who actually, interestingly enough, uh, became a master Zen calligrapher. And she said, Jeremy, did you know you can take classes at the art school? So my degree was physics. There's no art in the physics, although physics, of course, has, is an art in itself. But my degree was physics. But in my spare time, I used to go and do art. So I remember saying to my mom at some point, you know, pointing at something on a wall in a museum and saying, I want to be on that wall one day. And this was when I was about eight years old. You know, so I had this vision when I was a little kid, I would be you know, an artist, famous artist. What I was interested in was research and you know, understanding the universe. And I assumed that I would do something uh, and discover something, you know, maybe. You know, I loved Einstein and all that stuff. So uh, I wasn't sure how that translates into a job, because I didn't really want to do research, like a PhD in one little corner. I went for an interview for a job which I thought was a research development job and it turned out it was an interview for a sales job. They described the sales work and you know the adventure and going out and discovering uh, it was cryogenics going out and discovering who's using liquid helium and traveling around the universities and I thought wow this actually sounds pretty fun. So I got the job. That job took me all over the world and uh, took me uh, to live in the Netherlands, to travel to India, and ultimately to come and live in America. All that happened with that job. By day, wear a suit and tie and be Mr. Oxford Instruments and go and meet professors and talk about cryogenics, superconducting magnets and all that. And then by you know, night, I would go and do life drawing and I would sketch and I would go uh, and do classes and etching. I would take vacation and work with artists and spend a week with them you know, around the country. And I've been a professional artist for 20 years. Um, I was giving a lecture in Oxford on painting, digital painting, and my ex-boss came along. So he told me that the reason I got my original job uh, in sales was because on my resume I was the president of the Oxford University Rock and Roll Society because I'm a fanatical dancer and he said anybody who's the president of the uh, Rock and Roll Society must be interesting and fun and that's he said that that was it that's why he hired me you never know when you follow your passion where it leads like my passion was dance as well and that led me to this job that let, brought me to America and here's a really interesting circle brought me to America by coincidence, living in the center of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, uh, technology of digital painting suddenly evolved because um, uh, three things happened in unison as I was there. And that is the personal computers, Macintosh, got uh, powerful enough. All that came together as I was there and I got introduced to that technology in 1991 and never looked back. I fell in love with it. There, is, there are differences and parallels between working traditionally with physical media on a canvas versus working in a computer with digital paint. So obviously the physical media, you get a bit messier, you've got more tactile sense. I like that. And you've got a unique one of a kind end result. But with digital paint, um, there's an incredible freedom. I love it. I flow with it. I can, you know, I, it's like a second skin for me. It's like, I just love it. So I can do so much so efficiently, so quickly, and with such diversity of color and mark and, and texture. So all of that is just amazingly powerful in digital paint. And I love the freedom I have with digital paint. I do love teaching. And just like today with my students, uh, in this iPad uh, drawing class, um, it's just amazing at seeing how much both of them 
got out of the class. And ha the amount of enthusiasm and energy and joy, um, you know, I mean, there's no price you can put on that. Well, I love teaching. I've, I mean, I also love performing. I was in Toronto performing at the Nuit Blanche uh, Festival. It's an all-night arts festival, and I did digital painting projected on huge LED screens, uh, seven eight-foot by eight-foot screens spread over 100 feet of street. My students range from professional artists, professional photographers, to people who've never, ever drawn in their life. And I love it um, working with all levels of experience. Everybody can uh, derive so much joy from art, from making art, from doing art. And it's, it's not an exclusive preserve of artists or the few. When I'm teaching, uh, what I really want to share is, is an enthusiasm and an attitude and an approach of just go for it. Have fun, move forward, don't worry about things not being perfect, but just enjoy the process. And um, when, when people just go for it, amazing things happen. And I see that happen every time I teach. Today when I was teaching, I used Sketch Club. I'm using an iPad with a variety of different styluses. The iPad isn't the only mobile device out there, of course not. There are many great mobile solutions and I use a lot of different mobile solutions. Some of the apps I use, like Sketch Club, don't exist right now on other platforms. They only exist on the iOS platform. Training in physics is really a training in problem solving. Taking complexity and bringing it down to simplicity. I am having to abstract from what I see an essence and a sim simplicity, a foundation, a framework. That's exactly what physics is. You look at a complex world, the world we exist in, you have an enormous amount of data and then you do something with it which is you create a simple framework from which to explain it. That is what I do as an artist. So yes, there's a huge amount of common linkage between the two. I'm a natural inquisitive person. That is who I am. I'm inquisitive. I'm always asking questions and always looking around, always wanting to experiment and always wanting to try things out. That's who I am. So the future is all about exploration for me. It's not about standing still or just doing the same things again and again. Also, I get bored, so, you know, real easy. I need to have a lot of stimulation. So I, I never want to keep doing the same things again and again. I want to prod and you know, poke around and see what can I do that's different and, and it make, keeps life uh, fun, keeps me on my toes. It's a program run by the San Francisco General Hospital Foundation which supports the General Hospital and every year um, they commission eight large hearts to be painted by uh, artists and artists have to submit a proposal and then they choose eight. I started doing research on the film noir films and uh, piecing together a sort of collage of scenes of the city in black and white. And on the other side of the heart, I thought I'm gonna have a two, you know, wrap around two-sided heart. I'll have the black and white film noir on one side. And then on the other side, I'm gonna have uh, my sort of, you know, glorious tribute to San Francisco, what I call to San Francisco heart. That's the name I gave it. I went to Union Square and I photographed a heart in my favorite position on the square. And then I substituted my design and then sent that to them as a submission. And they picked it. And now, you, as an artist, you have no control over where your heart is put. And they put them all over the city. And then when it came to it, Fast forward, um, they put my heart in exactly that position. And I couldn't believe it. It was the best position in the city, uh, right on Union Square, Geary and Powell. When you're selected, the hospital literally delivers to your doorstep the most humongous, huge, white fiberglass heart on a heavy 400 pound stand and you know, and it's huge. It's like six foot wide and five foot deep. It's massive. And then you have about six to eight weeks uh, to paint it. 
oh boy, 40 feet of 44 inch wide canvas to get around this heart. So it was a huge project. Plastered on this digital print on canvas, started layering on all sorts of media and metal leaf. I even put a World Series ticket because at that time, it was 2011, that was, a, a, that was another t occasion when the Giants won the World Series. And that ticket was really funny because it was on the heart behind varnish. And for the entire time the heart was on Union Square, people would try to scrape it off. I had to keep going repairing the heart, <laughs> repairing it because people would try scraping it off. It was so funny. You know, I did a degree in physics and ended up getting this job in sales and marketing, but at the same time, I was doing art. I was making art. I was drawing all the time. It was present in my life all the time. I would say it's more of an obsession. I couldn't help doing it. It was a wonderful career and it got me to travel the whole world and go to India and then come and live in America. So, I mean, amazing opportunities through my job, which I loved. Um, but I always did have that niggling feeling. Is this really what I want to do with my life. My heart and soul are, is in my art. I got my green card, thankfully, then I got laid off and then I started looking for a job for a couple of weeks. And then after a couple of weeks something just hit me where it was like I think I woke up one day and I thought, what am I looking for a job for? Why don't I just do what I love to do? It's just like, why not? You know, why not go for it and see what happens? I don't really think I asked anybody's permission or advice on it, you know? I just, it just happened and it felt right and I'm still doing it 20 years later, you know. One of the biggest fears is, huh, how on earth am I going to afford to live, especially in an expensive area like San Francisco Bay Area. Back in 1994, when I went for it as an artist and, you know, I just thought, I'll just do it. The truth is I didn't think through it. And if I had, I probably wouldn't have done it. <laughs> I mean, it's just the fact. Now, 20 years later, um, I've been developing my businesses over the years. They're all connected with art. I do earn my living full-time as an artist. One thing I've found is that, at least my experience has been, that you can't rely on a magic bullet. And this is this concept that, you know, if only I get that one big thing. Interesting was, as I painted and I picked color and I picked a brush and I made a brush stroke, everything felt natural. It was intuitive. I didn't have to like struggle. I mean, uh, it just was amazing. It was like I went from drawing on paper to drawing on digital, you know, and it was just like, yep, that's it. Oh, I love it. It's, it's, yeah, I've been doing it for a while just totally for fun. And every chance I get, I will sit down. I'm now retired and I will just love to sit at a coffee shop and just start drawing things and I have grandchildren and my own children and and I just just love being creative. Oh, now Jeremy got me started. He didn't he doesn't know it, but he got me started a long time ago when I discovered Corel Painter, which is on the computer and with the Wacom tablet and everything and I I discovered that and I love his style. I love the colors and the the lines and how everything flows and so I was always inspired by his work, and then I started finding out he had books, he had you know DVDs, and so I started following him on that, and uh, that's that's been years and years ago. This is less messy. This is you know digital is much less messy, and I can do it anywhere. I can I love painting, and and again I just do it for fun, but uh, you can actually paint on this digital anywhere you go, and you have all your stuff with you, and you don't have to pack up a whole suitcase worth of brushes and clean it up. And, and everything along those lines. So, I, I like to be creative, and I like to I like to make things pop. I do photography as a hobby as well. And when I learned how to develop them myself, and you know, like shoot in raw, and then uh, you know, go on Lightroom and Photoshop and develop these things, make them pop, doing things um, like you know, high high dynamic range. I just love that look, and and it's just it's just fun to be creative. What my experience has been is it just doesn't happen. It's not like that. Now, I've had some very, very big sales and I've had big commissions, but the, the silver bullet isn't there. It's not one thing that, that I'm waiting for that, oh, that will solve all the problems. So in terms of, you know, uh, as an artist, an advice to artists is a lot of it is simply hard work. There's no doubt about it. I work way harder than when I ever worked for an employer. 
And that's it. You just plug away and it's incremental and it's like the way that a painting itself builds up. It's a lot of work. You just have, you know, even a quick painting and all that experience goes into it. It's a lot of work. You have to practice, you know, your, your art form and you have to plug away and you have to persevere and you have to deal with a lot of frustration and you have to deal with rejection and failure and things that don't work out and just keep moving forward just like a painting. So um, that's, that's how it is. Great. How, how do most people find you today? Is it? Um... Huh. Fascinating. I am always bowled away. It's like the things I just mentioned to you that I've just done in the last few weeks even. The Toronto job at Nuit Blanche. The, the wedding. Um, the Las Vegas job I'm going to in a few days. All three of those, they just Googled me. Uh, they just Googled something and found me. They found me on the web. They looked at my work. They saw some examples and it were intrigued and liked the quality of what they saw and contacted me. So a lot of people, I think, you know, a lot of business is coming through the web. You know, I have jeremysutton.com, my main website uh, f uh, for, me, uh, for, for me as an artist and I have the Paintbox TV for teaching. But um, I think people just... Uh, they must Google, uh, you know, live painting or things like that, and uh, digital art. And I'm not always sure, of, you know, what they Google, but that's the main thing. And I, you know, in terms of marketing, you know, I try to be good, but I'm so busy, I don't really have time to be a big marketeer for myself. I mean, you know, I know that one is meant to do a lot of things and social media. You know, I try to tweet now and then and put a Facebook thing here and there and send an email out, but honestly, I'm so busy, I, I don't really have enough time. Um, so a lot of it is just, you know, coming through the web and I guess some word of mouth. Um, Cirque du Soleil, I worked with uh, Totem when they were here and that was through someone in this building who knew that I did some performance work and was asked by someone at the AT&T ballpark, do you know someone who does live painting? And they said, you should contact Jeremy Sutton. So word of mouth also helps a lot. Great, okay, so one, one of the last questions I'll ask, what um, if you know someone else who is, say, in a similar, kind of similar position mm -hmm. that you were in is in a different career, they do art on the side, they want to pursue mm -hmm. art, passion as a career, what advice would you give that person in today's you know, world? But it's funny because a lot of my students are exactly what you're describing. Um, there are people, a lot of them, who have other careers. Sometimes the careers are closely related, like they're professional photographers and they want to learn to, to do digital painting from their photos. But sometimes they're doctors or they're retired or, you know, all sorts of different professions. Um, and they're following a passion they have for art and for painting, for creativity. Um, now, I always just encourage people to just go for it and take risk and to be bold, both in what they do, you know, in their paintings as well as in life. Um, so I think your question was more specifically about people who are thinking about a career change as opposed to just have an established career and want to get their creative juices uh, going uh, in parallel. Is that right? Sure. So you're thinking about people who uh, are pondering making the leap yes. into taking a lot of risk. So um, it's interesting. I would say that you know it's a very individual thing because it takes an enormous amount of um, willingness to tolerate uncertainty, to tolerate risk, to tolerate chaos and which you need to do in a painting anyway. But to, to take a leap into stepping out and going for it, and I have friends who've done that. Uh, a musician friend of mine uh, was working in finance for years and he's an amazingly talented piano player. And he kept asking me, wondering, Is that Jeremy, uh, I really want to go for it as a musician and I'm a bit afraid, you know. And I always encourage him, I just kept encouraging him and he did go for it and he's a full-time musician now and he's loving it and he's doing great. Um, so I'd say that it's, it is not a blanket answer to that question because it's a personality thing. And some people, maybe they don't have the personality for it. You really have to be prepared to step in and tolerate a lot of uncertainty and chaos. Um, but if you're, if, you, if you're prepared to do that, then I would say 
you know, get your, as much as you can, um, get your eggs in your basket, sort out things as much as you can. Obviously, it makes sense to save and have uh, some sort of a nest egg, to have some sort of a cushion and um, plan this if you can, if you're in a job, if you're earning good money, you know, put some money aside so you create a cushion. And then just set yourself a time when you're going to go for it. The, the, one, the one thing I would say in terms of um, specific advice is that my impression is, and I know from my own experience, but my impression is that there is no perfect time and there are always reasons not to do it. Period. So, there's never a perfect time and there's always reasons not to do it. So, you, if you are looking for perfect time and if you're worried about reasons not to do it, you'll never do it. So, you have to accept whenever you jump in to do this stuff, it's messy. You're not suddenly, you know, it's not smooth sailing, it's messy. But that's okay, messy is part of life. So, as long as you're prepared to live with that, I'd say I encourage, you know, go for it. Great, yeah. Jim, anything else? Um, we have a stream of oh, so a more. Oh, and also I wanted to add one more thing about the heart. Uh, that uh, When I was thinking about the heart as a project, um, one of the things I wanted to share was that um, for me as an artist, it was amazing, amazing to go as much as I could to Union Square and just watch, and watch people reacting with the heart. And I've never seen anything like it. I mean, non-stop, day and night, people would respond to this artwork. And everybody would take their photos. There's no doubt it's the most photographed object I've ever painted, and it probably will be in my whole life, because I spoke to the people who run Union Square, and they said that in the six months that it was on the square, they expect, you know, like seven million people or so go through that square during the time when it was there. And, um, and whenever I was there, people were always taking photographs. So it, but it was just an incredible experience just to see how much uh, art can be part of community, how much pleasure it can give. I mean, the kids running up and touching it, the adults, you know, the, the married couples, uh, I mean, it was just like non-stop. Um, and I'll just finish with one funny story was that because I had a webcam, my friend uh, Luke Weinstein ha had a gallery right opposite. I see they still do, the Weinstein Gallery. So they very kindly let me put a webcam pointing at my heart. And so I had 24-7 coverage. Um, and uh, so at one point, and it was a Wi-Fi webcam, so I could look at it from anywhere. Dropcam, actually, was the, the webcam I used. At one point, one morning, I looked at the webcam, because I would get up and look at the webcam, with like, oh, my heart. It was on its side. It was, it had fallen down. And it was like, oh, my gosh, you know. I said, Peggy, the heart's fallen down. Oh, my gosh. So we, like, rushed over there, you know. It was like the baby. The baby's fallen down. So we rushed over to Union Square, and sure enough, the heart was laying on its side. And But the, it, if, amazingly enough, uh, and I probably shouldn't say this on the record, the heart was fine. There was a tiny bit of scratch here and there. But uh, it had taken a chip out of the stairs. So it was so solid, that fiberglass heart thing, I don't know how they did it, but it was so solid, it actually had, it had taken a tiny chip out of the steps. But um, they lifted it back and, you know, took care. And I went and had a look back on my webcam because I was really curious. How does this big heart fall over? And the, sure enough, middle of the night, one o'clock in the morning, I found it on the webcam. This uh, guy, just it's, there's no one around, it's dark. And you see this guy walking up the steps, and I don't know if he was what he was on or whatever. He was sort of out of it, and he just goes up to the heart and he just pushes it over, and then he carries on walking. It was the funniest thing. <laughs> anyway, I guess that's what they say. That's San Francisco, right? It takes everybody. <laughs> that's a great story. Um, how long did it take you to complete the heart project? Um, I recall it was about two months. I kept asking for a bit more time. I really worked a lot on it, so um, the actual painting was about two months. It was right here where you're sitting, actually, and it literally took up this huge space, and I was circling around it, painting and doing stuff to it. So. Very cool. Thank you.
How long does it take to do your average digital portrait? <sighs> well, uh, of course, that's how long is a piece of string. Um, I, um, it varies, but um, when I'm doing live events and uh, as an entertainment, a special event, you know, I end up taking 10, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, quick, quick sketches on my iPad or something. But then when I take uh, a bit more time, um, I prefer to you know, spend a bit more time, sort of you know, half an hour, 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Um, I'm a very quick painter and I'm a very quick drawer. So, um, so in terms of live portrait, which one about live portrait, you know, sort of that sort of time frame. Okay. Maybe up to about an hour. Now, I do a lot of work uh, where I do work with a so photo reference, and I do collages like the one you saw of Jamwall. Now, those can take months, or even longer. I mean, I've spent years on, on some projects, but um, basically, uh, those complex collages, the, the San Francisco heart, that, that, the actual original digital collage, took, you know, I worked on it for months. That doesn't mean I'm sitting down painting all the time for months. It means I work on it, I leave it, work on something else, come back to it, get stuck, leave it, come back to it. So, well, because of what I'm doing is visual. So, my, I, I brainstorm with my visual ideas in the moment. And that is what I'm doing when I start any artwork. I am always brainstorming. That is the process. Um, so it depends on the type of project. Like on Saturday when I was at this wedding, I walk in, I've, I'd already checked the place out, but I was in a cellar, a wine cellar in Satui Winery, beautiful place. And I looked at the landscape, you know, the, the landscape of what was before me it's, uh, and thought about composition and I thought about um, what do I want to include and how far do I want to go to the right and the left. So I started thinking about the composition like that. If I'm doing a collage, I, I look at all my images and then I think, where, what do I want to be the root, the heart, the foundation? And maybe there's one image that stands out or a couple. And then I start playing with the composition around that. And so start developing it. Um, if I'm just looking at a portrait and doing it from life, then usually I'll think about how I want to place the portrait in the canvas, the shape of the canvas, the positive and negative space. And uh, so I map that out in my mind and I start to map it out on the canvas. So in terms of, uh, is that what you meant by workflow? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that kind of what you guys meant? Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Good. Good. Mm -hmm. All right. First of all, the tools I'm using for digital painting in this case are a Macintosh computer and iMac. I'm using a software called Corel Painter 2015, fabulous software. And I'm using a Wacom Intuos Pro tablet, pen tablet, with a stylus, a pen. So my whole interaction with the computer is always through a pen or of course with um, nowadays also with an iPad touch or stylus as well and sometimes with air, with motion and gesture but in this case pen. And um, so within Painter, Painter is like an art studio in your computer and you've got hundreds and hundreds of brushes. Some of them I've customized and a special, some of them come with the program, hundreds. Now, I don't use hundreds in a project like this. I use a few and every project is different. I get a feeling for a different brush. But what the brush that you saw me start this project with, when I just went crazy, I filled the whole canvas really quickly with this sort of crazy, um, wavy brush stroke. And that was a brush called Modern Art in a Can. And it's an old brushing painter that I have sort of rescued from earlier versions and brought forward. So I started with that. And then I started using a variety of different brushes to give different type of um, uh, effects and brush strokes and textures. So um, I used something called a Sargent brush, named after the great painter, John Singer Sargent. I used 
a brush I made called Sumi Pollock Splash, named after Jackson Pollock. Um, and I have uh, used a variety of other brushes as well. And so in this case, I'm looking at the sky. I want to have like a reddy orange, so around this sort of color. See there? And then what I like about this brush is it creates a variety of color within the brush stroke. And it has a very organic look. I'm going to introduce a little bit of yellow here. I feel like this is a bit too blue. So I'm going to go grab this temple color palette, go for the yellow, bit of an orangey yellow. Notice it's not a pure yellow and I'm not totally saturated. And there we go, a little hint of yellow. But I love the way it just hints and it just flows in. There we go, a little hint. And then here I'm sticking to sort of aqua sort of looks and effects. So I'm going with a bit more of the greens. I'm also going to reduce the um, brush size a bit so I can uh, control my brush size. Maybe a bit bluer than that. So I'm continually making adjustments to, to brush size, to the brush itself, to the color, um, to the tone, to the value, to the saturation. So it's a continual process. Then I'm going to work into the um, face a bit and let's see what we've got here. I'm going to go for a smeary camel cloner. And this is actually one of the interesting aspects of working with this program called Painter. Is that if you want, you can draw upon color from a source image in another place. So if you look very carefully at this uh, image over on the left, you'll notice that as I paint, there's a crosshair moving around. And that's just showing where color is coming from. That's all it's doing. So it's just giving a reference. And then I can go back and forward between using that and then picking my own color. Like with her hair, I want to, I want to get that wonderful sense of fluidity and the highlight and the shadows of the hair. So now I'm just looking and responding. I'm adjusting, always making adjustments. And adjusting there, I felt I needed a darker tone. So I've gone for a darker brown. And all the time I'm using pressure sensitivity. So everything I do is modulated by the pressure I apply. And that's controlling things like brush size, depending on the brush, but brush size or opacity. I am modulating pressure that I apply here. So even though you can't really see it, as I make a brush stroke, I press harder or softer, and that in turn controls things like the brush thickness, uh, the brush opacity. So I have an enormous amount of very, very subtle control. And then you'll see my left hand now and then go to these buttons on the side. You can hardly see the buttons actually, they are there. But so I'm gonna click. And what that does is it brings up, um, these are all shortcuts. So that's a shortcut for my color wheel. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the screen now, what I just did was I brought up this color wheel here. And I'm just going to go for something a bit more in the purple blues there. Purple blues, and I'm going to apply a bit of that here. Just feel like it. Sometimes my color traces are, you know, direct observation, um, and sometimes it's a combination of direct observation with just a little bit of intuition and feel. I just feel like that's a color that will work there, so I use it. And I experiment, and I can always change. So one of the things that you'll notice is also, I never do an undo. 
It's always forward motion. Doesn't mean that everything's in the right place. I, I make mistakes all the time, and things are in the wrong place all the time. So I'm continually adjusting, but it's always forward motion. Always moving forward. I, I try to not get precious about every brush stroke, and when you don't undo, you you have a commitment to every brush stroke. Whereas if you start undoing and saying, oh, that's not quite right, let's undo it and try again, you start to get really precious about what you do, and it actually blocks you, I think, from moving forward. So as you can see, it's a very organic process, just like traditional painting, but a bit more comfortable, because instead of holding a brush like this, and my whole arm getting tired, and wrist and everything, I'm here, so it's very relaxed. This is like no stress, no effort, no force, and uh, it's really comfortable. Okay, so uh, how, um, how do you think of Jeremy's work? What do I think of Jeremy's work? Mm -hmm. uh, Jeremy's work is, in my opinion, as a photographer, amazing. I, uh, from the first time I met him, which was about four and a half years ago, I, uh, when I first saw his work, he was making very large uh, paintings. And uh, uh, many of them, the the uh, primary, uh, I don't know how to describe it, his, his, he focused mostly on large pieces of people that we knew from the past, uh, baseball stars, movie actors and actresses. Uh, and uh, which was great. I mean, and it was so real. Uh, you felt like you wanted to go walk up and, and shake the person's hand in the that, that was in this painting. Uh, and little by little, he he began to become more focused on smaller pieces, not real small, but. Uh, not as large as the ones he, he started with four and a half years ago when I met him. And he, uh, what he, he started, what he was doing also, even the, the same time he was working on these paintings, he was teaching. He was teaching art, painting, and he was uh, photography to some extent. And, uh, and I watched him grow. Uh, I watched him develop, actually, month after month over the, over the four and a half years that I've been had been here in the studio. And uh, he he was not only teaching locally, but he was teaching all over the country, the United States, and then eventually in London, which is his home hometown and uh, in other parts of the world. I know he was working uh, a lot with uh, uh, the digital painting and uh, uh, which was fascinating. We, we would have a, uh, uh, an open studio weekend Saturday, Friday night, Saturday and Sunday uh, usually he had it in this, actually in this studio building in this room now where we are. Uh, he had a big screen which is up on the ceiling right now and he would just pull that huge screen now and working from his computer he would show anybody who came in how you would, you could sit someone down and do a portrait of that person and watch it on that screen as you did the work with a computer. His classes here in this this particular studio room were were just incredible to watch. 
interesting ones. So how do you think uh, what's the difference between Jeremy and the other painting, painting uh, person? I, Jeremy is a natural. He is he's one of the most creative artists that I I've, I've ever seen. Yes. He has he doesn't have to force anything. He can he can just sit down and have someone sitting next to him or in front of him and he can draw a portrait of that person in less than a half hour. And yes. it'll be perfect. I mean really perfect. Uh, his creativity, working on the computer, I've watched him, he's got two or three large computer screens and, and computer operating systems, and he, he just works those machines as if he's been with them for years. Did I answer your question? Yeah, of course. Any other and, uh, questions? Uh, can you talk about uh, his personality? His personality. Uh, I'm not sure you are, you are aware of the fact that Jeremy has uh, done a lot of work with his, his very good friend, Peggy, who has the studio next door. And uh, they've done a lot of work in different uh, museums, art museums, where uh, he, he and Peggy would dance a theme, an, almost an art theme, uh, or dance to a particular music that fit an era, a time when the paintings that each of them have done, or the ones especially that, James, that uh, Jeremy had done, uh, the paintings typified the era of the music. And I've watched them literally perform as if they were on a stage in these, in these big art museums. It's, uh, th th it's a talent. It's, a, it's an amazing talent. Uh, I, I can't say more, uh, much more about him. It, I mean, this, all I can say, he's one of the greatest artists I've ever met. Um, and, uh, I think uh, it's enough. Yeah. So, do you, have you talked about his personality? I mean, uh, work with people or his his uh, private life. How how he uh, talk with person? How he talks with people? He can sit. Down. We've gone to lunch many times, and he can sit down at the table, and someone could sit next to him, and within ten seconds, they're good friends. I mean, he he'll strike up a conversation with a total stranger. And within 10 minutes, 15 minutes, they're, they're t exchanging phone numbers and addresses and uh, anything that has to do with art or photography, they're talking about. He's got an amazing person. He's funny, he, he's, uh, and he, he's just a pleasant person to be with. His personality is a big people always talk about his personality. Okay, so when you saw this uh, picture, so how do you think? How do you think Jeremy's work and uh, how do you like it? Oh yeah, it's exciting. it's more it's better than what we thought it was gonna be. It's very nice. I always blended together all the memories we've had from driving around with this car and we've had it for I don't know almost ten, years. ten years and so it's just yeah, you know, this is gonna be such a great memory that, that he's made come to life like this all the special moments that we've enjoyed and now we have kind of something to keep and cherish. It'll be a part of our family, just like the car was. <laughs> and, uh, I saw uh, you have two dogs. Yeah, yeah. Two dogs and two children. Yeah, they're all in here. And the, the daughter and the son and doing what they do and all our group shots and when we, we go take drags together and just, uh, yeah, just the whole feeling of the car really came through with the painting, just all these different angles of it and the, the kids were riding around like it was a roller coaster and those are all such, you know, we really remember how fun it was. So how do you think that Jeremy's work 
Oh, it's amazing. It's great just to see his studio. He's, yeah. he's very, really good at what he does. I love, yeah. I love his long dark video. <laughs> the giants. Yeah. But we first saw his other Buick one, and that was what kind of it's struck just, a chord. The Buick for his friend. I just like how he can do a little bit of his own paint work. You know, he had throw some of those little touches in there. He can, uh, you know, it's, it's not just photographs. He just makes it, you know, more of a as a painting. You know, so it's a great blend. Well, we're really happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay.